right? Welcome to Explore Classroom, everyone. My name is Gina Borgia, and I am so glad you are joining us today. It is our finale event of Explore Classroom, so it is extra special. And here at National Geographic, we use the power of science, exploration, education, and storytelling to illuminate and protect the wonder of our world. And this Explore Classroom YouTube show connects students from around the world with our National Geographic Explorers for short lessons and a chance for your questions. So today we have an extra special event, as I mentioned. I'm live at the National Geographic Society headquarters in Washington, DC, and I'm joined with three fantastic explorers today. Today, we're going to have a chance to hear from explorers Kay and Grace, Carlos Velasco, and explorer at large, Bob Ballard. KM is a political scientist and co-founder of the environmental organization Center for Sustainability. She works with local communities to preserve the last 3% of pristine rainforest in the Philippines. So exciting. And Carlos is a biologist and citizen science advocate. He collaborates with leaders, explorers, and organizations like the Mexican Biodiversity Authority, Authority Canavio, to empower local communities to experience and protect nature using tools like iNaturalist. And Bob is best known for his historic discoveries of hydrothermal vents, the sunken RMS Titanic, and the German battleship Bismarck, to name a few. He has conducted more than 150 deep sea expeditions over the course of his career and is involved in various educational outreach programs. So we have an incredible lineup for you today. But before we hear from our explorers, I wanted to welcome all of the classrooms who are joining us today from around the world. So we have shout outs for the Cool School, Higgins Middle School, Hutchins Museum Institute, London Town Elementary, the March Academy, Planet English, IBIME Montes, R. Pete Woodward Junior High School, SUNY Fredonia, Spruce Elementary, the Carasone Family, Coalingo Middle School, Cleveland Early College High School, Ilaho Rural School, Yarmouth High School, St. Bruno St. Raymond, Village Oaks Elementary, Eastern Suffolk, Tukemsay Elementary, Triton Academy, and the Fox Family. And of course, all of our homeschools out there. We are so glad that you could be here with us today. And with that, let's get this Explorer Classroom started. So I'm gonna turn it over to our explorers. And first up, Kayam, we'll start with you. Okay. Yeah. Can you cool. tell us a little bit about your work and why that's important? Yep, absolutely. So hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining. I'm Kayam Reyes and I'm coming from the Philippines from a very little island on the Western side called Palawan. And I have a very small organization. We're a women led or girl led youth environmental nonprofit. And our mission is to conserve the Philippines' last remaining 3% of pristine rainforest. And so the Philippines before used to be 95% covered in rainforest, and now only 3% is left. So we're on a race to protect it um, with our team at CS. And so to do that, we work with indigenous communities and local communities who live in and around this forest. And we work with them, talk about what they want to protect this area for and how we should do it. From there, we work with really important and really fun scientists that are really interested in all the different parts that we have in a rainforest. So the wildlife, the fauna, the flora. Um, and then from there, we also work with decision makers like politicians so that we can have long and strong laws that make our forests protected um, in policy, so like rules, but also on the ground and supporting our communities. And this area is really important, this place that we work in called Palawan, because it's actually the last biodiversity frontier of my country, of the Philippines. And the Philippines is one of only 17 mega biodiverse countries in the world. So what that means is that the Philippines is an area where there's more biodiversity, more fauna and flora than most other places on the planet. And so for that, we work with lots of different communities to do that. Um, and yeah, and that's kind of the work that we do. 
Wonderful. Do you want to talk a little bit about what they might be seeing on the screen there? Yeah, certainly. So on the right hand side, this is a really typical um, expedition. So I was talking earlier about how we work with communities and with scientists. And so on this expedition, we're actually bringing the two parts together and training our local indigenous and local communities to become scientists themselves. So this is a meeting late at night. We've been trekking for like five or six hours. And then from there, we settle down around this meeting and we talk about what our plans are and the things that we're hoping to discover in the forest. We're using about 30 or 40 people. And then from there, we go out to all the different parts of the forest and do research on mammals, on different kinds of um, herbs, so like snakes, and lizards, and frogs. We also do research on different kinds of birds and insects. And then at the very end, the photo on the left-hand side is after the expedition is finished, there's about 40 of us there and we're totally wiped out and we're ready to hike back down the mountain with all the different things that we've discovered so that we can share it with different audiences, including schools like yourself. Good. Thank you so much for sharing that. All right, let's hear from you, Carlos. Can you tell us a little bit about your work and the types of tools that you use? Thank you so much. And hello, hola, everyone. Um, from Northeast Mexico in the city of Monterrey. I'm a biologist and I have to say that I turned myself into a, natural, a naturalist person, not just trying to uh, research specific groups, but myself, I turned more into a citizen science advocate. And my mission right now is to help everyone and as much as, as much, um, the, the highest number of people that I can reach to use citizen science tool like iNaturalist and SIG mobile apps. This will help you and your classrooms or your communities to learn more about nature, to learn about the biodiversity that lives near around you. And I want you to think of yourselves as young explorers, young scientists that can actually contribute to science from wherever you are, no matter if you are in any country, you can actually do a lot on behalf of biodiversity. And that's why I've been working on during the last three years, collaborating with explorers like KM and other fellows from a lot of countries. But right now, I intended to actually go further and try to reach other communities across the planet. So if you are later interested in more details about learning about how to use citizen science tools like iNaturalist, just reach out to National Geographic and we can set up. Right now, uh, this is using like really, really uh, next generation technology to help us understand biodiversity around us so we can preserve it for future generations. Wonderful. Do you want to talk a little bit about what they're seeing there on the screen? What are you up to with those kids? Yeah, those photographs are actually uh, a few years back when we don't even have internet. We use field guides to walk through nature paths and to share this with the local communities. As you can see, kids like yourself, they were discovering nature, little creatures that wander around your garden. And this is something that you can do now by using any mobile device that you might have access and you can use this for good. So this is actually a great experience for young learners and teachers make sure you tap along with your classrooms and discover nature with them because sometimes adults don't feel like quite related as kids to nature. So this is a good example that kids has been near nature from a few years back and now they can use the power of technology to get closer to nature. Wonderful, thank you so much for sharing about your work. Let's turn it over to you, Bob. What would you like to talk about the students today? Well, as you said, I'm an explorer at large with the National Geographic Society. Believe it or not, I've worked with them for 50 years. I, in fact, I met my wife 33 years ago in this very room when she was working at National Geographic. So this is a special place for me at the Hubbard Hall. Uh, but my job right now is to mount the second 
uh, Lewis and Clark expedition of the new America. 55% of our country of America lies beneath the sea. Now we're really not calling it the Lewis and Clark expedition since 65% of our team are women. So we're calling it the Lois and Clark expedition. But our mission is to boldly go where no one has gone before in America. Believe it or not, we have better maps of Mars than our own nation. And at this very second, uh, when you have a chance, go online. My ship is out there right this minute. I just got off of it. I'll show it to you right now. It's called the EV Nautilus, and it's at sea right off the Johnson Atoll, which is in the Central Pacific Ocean, and we broadcast live. So we're not only broadcasting from our undersea vehicles to sign us to shore through the technology of telepresence, but we also broadcast 24 hours a day to classrooms just like yours. So you can go to novelslide.org, ask questions, but you can also, as individual classes, sign up for dedicated broadcasts. So we're doing it 10 months a year, 24 hours a day, where we go, it's always dark. We have to bring our own flashlights. So it doesn't matter what time zone you live in and tune in and we'll take you to a part of America no one has ever seen before. So exciting, Bennett. It feels so special to share this room with you that has such significance. <laughs> well, because of, yes. Yeah. Her name is Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> Could you talk a little bit about the um, telepresence and what that, that means to you, like that concept? Well, we've been commissioned by our country just to do this 10 year expedition. We're in year four now. But when you go to where no one has ever been before, you don't know what you're going to see. So the ship, the Nautilus, as you see in this illustration, is sort of like the emergency room at a hospital when the ambulance pulls up Sunday morning at two in the morning. We seem to make all our discoveries Sunday morning at two. <laughs> and you open the back door of the ambulance and it could be a mother having a baby. It could be someone that had a heart attack, some emergency. And so they don't necessarily have the doctor that's the specialist. So they do they what they can, but they get on the phone and they call out to doctors on call who live near the hospital, who have volunteered to come the moment something happens, well, this is how our system works. So we're down, we're in an area of the, remember we go where no one has ever been. And we turn the corner and there's something biological, geological, archeological, the whole list of possibilities. And we are able to reach off the ship and we have a watch leader who's sitting at the command center with a book of experts who have volunteered that you can call them. So they sign up for time slots, 24 hours a day for 10 months, we have names. We call them up, naturally if it's Sunday morning at two o'clock, they're in bed. <laughs> so we wake them up and we have them boot up their laptop while they're laying in bed. They boot up their laptop and we show them that at that moment what we're seeing. And we promise them it's only one way video, so you don't have to worry about their hair or anything. <laughs> and then they look at that feed, we patch them to the pilot and they have to make a decision. Should I get out of bed? 90 some percent of the time, they jump out of bed and they run to a command center that's hooked to our inner space center. So we have a, a communication hub called the inner space center where I'm a professor at the Graduate School of Oceanography at the University of Rhode Island. And it's feeding out on internet to level three, which is the new highway of education. In fact, in the future, we're now moving to where everything is being done with robots. Mm -hmm. I just did a cruise of just last week where we were having multiple robots doing all of this and eventually humans will be on land, believe it or not, most of the time. Wow. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, all right, students, it is question time, the time you have all been waiting for. So if you are watching on YouTube, you can send your question right in the chat bar. You only need to send your question one time. We record everything that you send in. And teachers, don't forget to let us know who's asking the question so that we can give your class or your student a nice big shout out. And if you have a specific question for a specific explorer, just also let us know who you'd like us to ask. And if you are up here on screen with us, get your nice loud voices ready. We will come to you very soon for a question.
All right, so our first question, while we wait for some YouTube questions to come in, I'll ask a little bit about um, discovery. So each of you is out there in the field for different reasons, looking for different things. Could you talk a little bit about maybe um, a special moment that you came across something or cataloged something that was extra special? Well, if I may, uh, I can say that I've been monitoring my garden. I mean, you know, the front yard of my garden, well, of my homie, which is like really small. And I have so far documented using iNaturalist more than 700 different species, mostly little insects, butterflies. And this is something you can actually do on your school. Take a note of that. But one of the most amazing things on that is that we actually discovered a new species of tree cricket, which actually has a beautiful scene. I will share later uh, about this beautiful scene, but this was something that was just outside my door. So imagine what you can do on your home, on your local park, on your very own homes. Think about that. Making discoveries is just outside of your home. That's a great point, Carlos. Would either of you like to add, Cam or Bob? Yeah, okay, it's my turn. Um, so a few years ago, we were working in this one area that we were trying to protect as a national park, as a protected area. And we were out on one of those expeditions like the photo that I shared earlier. And we were out, actually it was at breakfast. We were like cooking rice and getting ready for the day. And then one of my colleagues just kind of dug out one of like a log that we were all sitting on. And we rediscovered the Malatgan Sicilian, which is, yeah, so um, it almost looks like a, like a worm, like an earthworm, but it's actually an amphibian. And specifically, this Sicilian had been lost to science since the Second World War. The last holotype that we had was at the National Museum of the Philippines. It was bombed during the Second World War. And so we actually just didn't know if it still existed. And so when we found that, it was like lots of scientists and geeky conservationists and researchers jumping up and down with our breakfast and our teas of coffee going, we made it, we made it. And because of this really important discovery, it was really important proof that we were able to show to our decision makers that this area had to be protected and it was really special. So that was a pretty special discovery for us. Well, speaking of worms, <laughs> let me set the stage. We're 9,000 feet down beneath the uh, ocean in the Pacific. 200 nautical miles from the Galapagos Islands, where the earth is splitting open and creating new tissue to the planet. Normally, you, it's like going to a barren waterfall. So imagine you're walking underwater with a flashlight in barren lava, and you come across hundreds of giant worms, giant worms that are over two to three meters tall. We were shocked. We had no idea. We grabbed one of them, we brought it back, and when we pulled it out, it bled human-like blood. It had a pint of human-like blood in it. And when we opened the body cavity of the worm, it had no internal organs. Its entire body had been taken over by another organism called an extremophile that had living symbiotically, it had cut a deal with the worms because the worms were on underwater vents that were blasting out like a fire hydrant. And this bacteria couldn't live in the fire hydrant. So it said to the worm, here's the deal. Let me live in your body, okay? How's the conversation going so far? I want you to breathe in this poisonous water full of hydrogen sulfide, kills everything. Keep going. So it's, it breathed it in, said, give it to me. I'll, I'll oxidize it through a process we had no knowledge of called chemosynthesis and I'll feed you. And we discovered an entire ecosystem living not off the energy of the sun, but off the energy of the earth itself. That was about as cool as it gets. That's <laughs> amazing. That is amazing. I think each one of those stories is amazing. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Ex ex the excitement that comes with discovering something like that. You, you're, it's addictive. <laughs> Once you make one discovery, you want the next and the next and the next. I agree. Yeah. All right. Let's take a question from one of our on-screen guests. Let's go over to Kaya. If you have a question, we're going to unmute your microphone and you can ask a question for one of our explorers. Hello. 
Um, so I'm going to be asking a question for Mr. Mr. Ballard. I think that's how you say it. Um, Ballard with a B. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So one of my ancestors was um, a survivor of Titanic. So what was your reaction when you um, found Titanic in the ocean? Well, it was amazing, particularly when we came across where the people who perished came to rest. Uh, in the Titanic, everything down there was Titanic inside, giant boulders, giant everything. And then nestled amongst all of that massive ship were pairs of shoes, not individual shoes, but pairs, just as they had been attached previously to humans. But when people who didn't have life jackets fell to the bottom, animals naturally found them. It's like in dying in the rainforest, someone's going to find you. And the animals will eat the human remains. And then the bones in the deep sea are dissolved. And all that's left behind are their pairs of shoes. And it's like their tombstones. And so when I came across those pairs of shoes, particularly when I came across a pair of mother's shoes with baby shoes next to her, I swore I would never take anything. And I never did. I never took anything from the Titanic because I think it was hallowed grounds that you come to respect and not pick things up. Mm -hmm. So that was pretty amazing. Thank you so much for your question, Kaya. Let's go over to thank you. Let's go over to Mr. <laughs> Isaac. We'll unmute you and you can send up one of your students to ask a question. Thank you, thank you. Hey, my name is Roxana and I have a question. He's talking to the class. Why did you decide to do this show? I'm sorry, we're having some trouble. Could you yell it. in the microphone and repeat that for her? Yes. My name is Roxana and my question is for Bob. And why did you decide to do this job? Why did you decide to do this job? Why did I decide to be an explorer? When, yes. I, was your, when I was your age, I lived in San Diego, and I loved to go down to the tidal pools, which changed every 12 hours. And it was like going to a new world every 12 hours. Sometimes I would go into the tidal pool and there would be an octopus hoping I didn't see it, hiding from me. The next tidal cycle, it would be gone and there would be a crab. And if I tried to pick up the crab, it would defend its life. And so it was always this kaleidoscope for me of exploration. And I just went on and on and deeper and deeper. And I'm, I'm dyslexic. A lot of kids out there that I'm talking to today, I'm sure, are dyslexic. And I learned how to take my dyslexia and turn it into an awesome tool to an advantage. In fact, there's a wonderful book called The Dyslexic Advantage. And we are visual creatures. I learn through my eyes. I'm not a good reader, but I can listen. And I, I never read 20,000 Leaks Under the Sea, but I saw the movie. And so I'm stimulated by visual stimulation. And I found that being an explorer, there's disproportionate number of explorers who are dyslexic because we, we do walkabouts. I get going and I'm out and about and I live by traveling in underwater landscapes. You guys do the same on land. I would love to find out how many of the emerging explorers are dyslexic like me because I'm going to try to find that out actually. So I've just always been a curious person. And I found by turning over rocks, like you turned over that stuff, you can't believe what you're going to discover when you turn over a rock. So go out and turn over that rock and see what's underneath it. That's great advice. Thank you. Thank you for your question. We have a YouTube question. We have Gabe from Isla Hole School, and they are wondering, KM, uh, how long have you been trying to save the rainforest is the question. Oh, how long have you been involved in the work? Yeah. So specific, thank you for your question, Gabe. Um, so I started in 2014, and it usually takes about three to four years 
um, to have all the different kinds of requirements that you need to go to a government and say that this area should be protected and is really important. And so started in 2014, we have a really big site now um, called Cleopatra's Needle that we've protected already. And we're actually working in a second site. Um, and our island, Palawan, there's still a lot of forest that needs protecting. So I started in 2014, but you'll probably see me in Bob's chair <laughs> soon enough saying, oh, I've been protecting forests for 50 years and I'm still gonna keep going. So yeah, just the beginning. <laughs> we certainly hope so. We'll see you then. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's take a question um, from Dr. Wormwood's Explorers. We are going to unmute your microphone and you can ask your question. Hi, thank you so much. We're coming to you from Seattle and we have a question for Mr. Ballard. Um, in my second grade class, we are ocean health advocates and we're wondering on your expeditions if you've seen any evidence of plastics. Oh yes, so wherever we go, particularly in the surface area. And now we're finding them inside organisms. Uh, in fact, they're even recommending you don't eat sea salt uh, because when they evaporate it, they're evaporating, it has microplastics in it. So go to the old, old salt mines that are, that are from the Triassic or Jurassic. Eat salt from salt mines and don't necessarily eat salt that's from evaporation. In fact, just to show you where it was, I was just saw an article in the paper just the other day about bonefish in Florida. Bodies are full of pharmaceuticals. Wow. The people go through the human body into the ocean and pharmaceuticals are now showing up inside fish. So yes, we need to be very, very careful about the kinds of things we create because we're now seeing them showing up in the food chain. And certainly that plastics is definitely, I do everything I can to avoid uh, purchasing plastics. And if I do, I make sure that they're put in, a, put in the ground and cannot get into the system. Thank you for your question. Thank you for that. Um, all right, Carlos, I have a question for you from YouTube. Brianna is wondering, uh, what are you most looking forward to in continuing your work? What's, do you have anything exciting coming up? Yeah, thank you, Brianna, for the question. And yes, my, my next big challenge is to make more young students to get engaged in participating into citizen science. I mean, documenting biodiversity around your area, your very home, is one of the most important missions that I have right now. So I think that if you keep your curiosity around yourself, as long as you keep growing and growing, please never to hesitate to ask questions about anything. And I think what that's one of the most uh, challenges that I will have in life to make more people interested in getting in touch with nature. Which is what we're all, and you just told me before we went on the program. Yes. I did a program much like this in 1989. Yes. And you were in Monterey, Mexico. <laughs> uh, living proof of what he just said. I was, I was a young student like yourself, and I was sitting in a classroom in a special place because we didn't have internet at the time. I was looking at one of his broadcasts, and that was like really, really uh, important moment in my life. And now I'm here sharing this with you, sharing this with <laughs> these amazing people collaborating. Remember collaboration among people is very important. So thank well, you. Each generation of explorers <laughs> puts the next generation on their shoulders and only they see the new horizons. Yes. So you're now lifting the next generation. Yeah. Oh. So that's what it's all about. Oh, this is so inspiring. <laughs> thank you all. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing. I think we're just, we have time for just one last question that I'd like I, to ask. Can I sneak out? I'm yeah. supposed to be at it. Yes, absolutely. I was just going to ask, and maybe you could start and then head on out. I was just going to ask if there's any last advice you'd like to leave our young explorers with today. Never lose curiosity and never grow old. <laughs> I am still in middle school in my mind. I'm going to run off to meet some new explorers who want to ask me some questions as well. So <laughs> thank you so much, nautiluslive.org. And we'll share that in the chat. Thank you so much for being with us today. Take care. I'm going to run. All right. Thank you. <laughs> All right.
Would you like to share anything yeah. else with the with the students today? General advice? Um, yeah, sure. I for the work that we do as explorers, and I think National Geographic Society shows that really well. It takes all passions and all walks of life to create an impact and make the world a better place. So I think you don't have to be a conservationist or work like Bob does in deep sea discovery. There's lots and lots of different ways to make an impact. And I think what's super important is to figure out what you love and then to make it about creating an impact for the world. Yeah, I, I have to agree with you, but also I will say that never stop learning. I mean, education, it's the key to your future dream keep dreaming imagine things don't let anybody tells you that you cannot do whatever you want to do dream be i mean a few years back i will never thought that i would be sitting by these amazing people sharing this with you so keep dreaming keep hoping professors teachers educators keep leaving those young minds it's a huge responsibility but you're, you're not alone I mean, reach out for help wherever you need it. So that's what I had to say for you. Wonderful. Thank you both so much for being with us today. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you, KM. And thank you, Bob, <laughs> who is he's, a very busy here. man. He's right here. Oh, yeah. He actually was sitting right beneath the portrait of himself, which is amazing. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, this is our last Explorer Classroom of the school year, and I wanted to send a big thank you out there to all of the students who have joined us over this school year. Thank you so much for your thoughtful questions, as always, and thank you to the teachers for making these events happen for your students. It's very special. Thank you so much. All right, keep an eye out on our website, natgeoed.org backslash Explorer Classroom. That's where you'll be able to find our fall schedule that will probably be released sometime over the summer. We have lots of other explorers who will be on to answer your questions starting in September of this year. So we'll just take a nice little break like all of you, and then we'll be back in September. Let's see, make sure I get all of my announcements. Um, you can register for a chance to be uh, a shout out or to be up here on screen with us at that same website, natgeoed.org backslash explore classroom and keep an eye out for that schedule. And I think now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Kit to just say a quick few announcements about how you can keep the learning going over the summer. I'll turn it over to you, Kip. Thank you, Gina. Friends, just because Explore Classroom is on break doesn't mean that you can't continue your summer learning journey. Join us for some summertime fun and keep growing your Explore mindset by participating in citizen science. Now, many of you may be wondering or may have missed, what is citizen science? Well, citizen science is when members of the public, students, teachers, parents, and you help conduct research to increase scientific knowledge. This can be as simple as taking a picture of anything that sparks your curiosity when you're outdoors. You can share what you find using the apps iNaturalist or Seek and join students from around the world helping to contribute to critical scientific research. Also, be sure to check out the citizen science resources that we've shared in the chat box on our YouTube page. And don't forget, we would love to see your work and learn more about what inspires you. So please share your experience with us using the hashtag, hashtag Explorer Classroom, tagging at Nat Geo Education on Twitter, or emailing us at exploreclassroom at ngs.org. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great day, everyone.